Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me tonight for Bible studies. We'll be back in John chapter 16. But before we get there, uh, just a heads up, we're running into some buffering issues on our end here. So we're going to try and get those taken care of. But I do have a few announcements just to kind of make to... Oh, well, I hope you're enjoying the day, <laughs> cooling off, hopefully a little bit. So Manu is here and Dave. Hello, Manu. Hi, Dave. Narda's here. Hi, Narda. Let us know you're here. Yep, just let us know if you're here as you're joining. Hopefully you're cooling off a little bit. I don't know, you know, where, where you are or if you've got... Uh, air conditioning in in your house we got a fan running I don't know if that's uh, creating an issue or not but we'll probably turn that off or and uh, do that so hopefully you have got yourself a thing of ice water or something to uh, sip on as we go through Bible study tonight so anyway we're just waiting a couple more moments um, for people to to log on so hopefully you have your Bibles and you'll be ready to use those as we go through uh, our study time tonight so so anyway here's just a couple of things that I want you to be aware of last week we had some problems with the the zoom feed for whatever reasons I'm not exactly sure what happened and so today we sent out uh, another uh, newsletter out. And so if you got that, you'll find the uh, address to log in to Zoom at the end. Or uh, you can go to uh, New Hope uh, Church, the family site on Facebook and log in that way. Uh, so that would be a help for you to do that. And then I don't know if you heard the... Um, County medical director, I'm not sure of her proper title, uh, gave an indication that churches can begin to meet again. Um, and from my understanding is that this Sunday uh, churches can meet, but we will not be meeting this Sunday. Uh, we've had stuff on order for about a month, hoping to get all the supplies that we needed. We've got uh, temperature, um, the thermometer the touchless ones where you just put it up to someone's forehead and it reads their temperature we've got some face masks that we have we even ordered some communion cups that are self-contained with the wafer and the juice all in one so uh, that's the best way to do that we've got gloves uh, we've ordered some cleaner hand sanitizer to uh, sanitize things in in the church and as far as I know, we're still going to have to follow the social distancing recommendations, which means we will be rearranging the chairs in the sanctuary. They won't be the um, cushion chairs that we have been using, but they will be metal chairs because they can be disinfected after each service and do that rather quickly. So uh, as much as things change, we're trying to adapt and do that. So. Um, kind of a target date that we have is maybe for Father's Day uh, to have our open services. Again, if we do the social distancing thing and we have the seating limitations, um, we, we will have approximately 40 seats available for uh, each service, um, which means we're going to be asking people to make reservations for seating kind of sounds like a fancy restaurant huh i guess dining at the king's table uh might might be that way but anyway we'll have to have that and so you'll need to sign up for a specific service and it's going to be the first ones that have a seat reserved um you will get that seat and then of course if you reserve a seat for a particular service we will want you to be there for that service. And so it can't be, well, I think I'll sleep in a little bit later and go to the later service. You may not have a seat. So uh, we, we want everyone to be welcomed and to come together and worship and, and hear the word of God. And of course, we want to save a couple of seats for potential visitors that may come. So there's so many things to work out. So be in prayer for the board. We're going to try and have a meeting this week. Uh, to just discuss 
how to best accommodate having services once again. So there's just a lot of details to work through. So pray for us that that would be awesome. We will do our best to keep you informed uh, and as up to date as we possibly can so that you know what's going on and there's not guesswork to be done even though it seems like guesswork is kind of the key phrase for almost everything these days. And uh, so tonight as we begin our Bible study, I want us to pray for our nation. Uh, our nation, as you are well aware, is in desperate need of God uh, and His intervention in our culture and in our society today. And that's on every level. And then just by way of information, Charlene Moore made it home from the hospital. She's been home for a couple of days now. Um, and so we are glad that she is doing much better. But let's go ahead and bow our, our hearts in a word of prayer as we ask for God's blessing on our time tonight and also for our nation. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Father, we cry out for mercy for our country. We pray for every member of our nation, from the one who feels the most insignificant to the one who sits at the top of the authority, be the elected uh, uh, government personnel, whether it be uh, Supreme Court judges, whoever they may be, all of us, Lord, forgive us of our sins. God, have mercy on our nation, and we ask you to do what only you can do, changing the heart of men and women and turning our hearts back to you. Help us to recognize your presence and your power for us, even as we go through difficult times. And Father, tonight we pray for our time in your word. Holy Spirit, come be our teacher, be our counselor. Help us to understand the deep truths of your word. And we'll give you thanks and praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight... Uh, we're going to go back to John chapter 16, John chapter 16, and we have spent uh, several weeks in this uh, one chapter, uh, but the chapter is uh, really an important chapter to have a good understanding on, so we're going to go ahead and uh, read in this chapter, um, let's see, let's go to John chapter 16, we will start reading at uh, verse 4 down through verse 11, and just to keep things in context, okay? So John chapter 16, starting at verse 4. But, but I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judge. Now, last week we spent time talking about righteousness. Jesus said righteousness because I go to the Father. So we spent uh, the entire time of our time just talking about the different aspects of righteousness. Tonight, I want to focus on the aspect of judgment. In verse 11, it says, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, let me ask you a question. And if you have a piece of note paper there uh, with you or on your study sheet that sent to you some weeks ago now, I want to ask you this question and think about the answer because during our Zoom time, I want us to talk about this question a little bit. All right, so here is the question I want you to think about and we'll discuss it, okay? When Jesus talked about concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judge, here's question number one. 
What does that mean to you as a believer? That the ruler of this world is judged. Okay, so what does that mean to you as a believer? Secondary question to that, how does the fact of knowing that Satan or demonic forces have already been judged, how does that impact your life? What difference does that make to you in your daily living? Or have you even ever really considered that before? So I think that's a, a question that is very, very important to understand. So what I would like for us to do now is go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians, the second chapter. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we're going to take a look at the first um, three verses here. All right, the first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2. It says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, I also want to read that same few verses of Scripture out of the New Living Translation and listen to how the New Living Translation puts those verses. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3. Once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins, you used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. We were born with an evil nature, and we were under God's anger, just like everyone else. So it puts it very simply in the New Living Translation of how we all were in that same category. But because the prince of this world has been judged, because Satan has been judged, because demon spirits have been judged, that should make a significant difference in our lives and how we live our lives. So this is something that is very, very important to understand. So when the ruler of this world has been judged, consequently, all of those under his authority were also judged. So as we talked about last week, the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to us because of our faith in Jesus Christ. So the Satan and demonic spirits are those that really influence people to disregard and to disobey God. They are the ones that are prompting people to live and act lawlessly in our culture. Well, all over the world, but specifically where we're most aware of what's going on in our state and in our nation. If you've been watching the, the news broadcast, it, it can be very discouraging, very heartbreaking to see all that is going on. And most of the time we're getting fractions of the story. And so we have to be diligent not to allow these things to cause us to feel a sense of hopelessness or fear. Because as God told Joshua, not to become fearful, not to become discouraged. Why is that? Because God would be with him wherever he went. And God is always with us. Yes, Satan and demonic forces have already been judged. 
but what we clearly see is sentence has not been carried out yet. So in the wisdom of God, God is even using this situation to turn us and those that are lost to a place of repentance before God, to humble ourselves, to cry out to him, to recognize our own sin nature and our own sinfulness, to ask God for forgiveness, to cry out to him for mercy, because it's going to take the mercy and the grace of God to turn any person around, but especially in our nation. So uh, when we are tempted to disregard what the Word of God says on whatever level to think, well, that's not important or I don't need to worry about that, anytime we disregard any part of Scripture, that should be a danger sign for us because the Scripture says the Word of God is perfect. It is flawless. It revives us. It gives light to the eyes. All of these benefits of knowing the Word of God. So uh, to disregard it is really to disobey it. Disobey it is the flagrant uh, before God of doing opposite of what His Word says. And again, if we watch the news at all, we see that playing out. I want to call your attention back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, if you go to verse 44, Jesus is talking with the religious leaders and he is calling them out for their evil hearts and evil behavior. And he equates them not to be men of God, but to be men of Satan. And in verse 44, here's what Jesus said to them. If I can just take this one verse, you can read this verse in context at a later time. Verse 44, in John chapter 8. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So we see from this one verse a snapshot into Satan's character. He is a murderer and he is a liar. Now there can be many other negative aspects to Satan's character, but Jesus points these two things out in context of John chapter 8. But just stop and think of what we see going on, whether a person is wearing a suit or is in a t-shirt and blue jeans. You can be a well-dressed liar or a poorly dressed liar. But liar becomes the key issue. You can be a well-dressed murderer or even in uniform, or you can be a murderer in tennis shoes and blue jeans. My point is not to characterize specific individuals, but it's just part of the sin nature that Satan manipulates to get us to act according to his desires. He is a murderer. He is a liar. And all of these different things that we categorize as being sin or sinful, whether it's an action or attitude, it is those spirits that influence us to behave according to his will. So when we see all of these things going on in front of us, we need to pray for every individual, whether they're a person of supposed authority or just a person on the street, whether they're an elected official or appointed official. Friends, it's not time to groan and moan about these people. It's time for us to pray for them. It's time for us to pray that God would bring people into their lives that would again share with them the good news of the gospel. If they've never heard, it's time for them to hear because this spiritual influence that is controlling them or manipulating them is causing them to act out according to satanic desires or motives. And so we need to understand that as men and women who've been saved by the grace of God, the enemy still tempts us. 
he still puts thoughts in our minds. That's why Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 says we're to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Philippians, Paul told the church in Philippi to whatever is good and lovely and pure and praiseworthy. Think about these types of things because where we let our minds go, our body is soon to follow. So we need to make sure that our thoughts are right before God. So again, what does it mean to us, me personally, you personally, to know that the prince of this world has already been condemned? You see, any time a person has to come into judgment, if it's a criminal that gets arrested, has to go before a judge, their criminality is defined by the specific law that has been broken. So when we think about this, judgment always occurs when an act or a thought is evaluated by an absolute principle. Okay, so judgment always occurs when a thought or an action is uh, evaluated against an absolute principle. The Word of God never changes. It is the same. It is eternal. It will never change. The Word of God doesn't change because of our cultural norms, because of our cultural whims or mores. No, the Word of God is forever the same. And so when we think about being judged or coming under judgment, it applies, judgment comes when our attitude, our words, or our actions are brought up against the truth of Scripture. Scripture will always be true, and Scripture will either approve or condemn our thoughts, our words, and our actions. So Satan, demons, have been come under judgment. They are already judged because Jesus Christ, the holy, the righteous Son of God, has gone to the Father. And because of that, because of his righteous, holy life, all of those things that Satan desires to do have come under judgment. So, so our actions are judged by our obedience or lack of conformity to the Word of God. When sin is confronted by the righteousness of Christ, condemnation is self-evident. Let me say that one more time. When sin is confronted by the righteousness of Christ, its condemnation becomes self-evident. Jesus' light shines in every dark place, and there is no dark place where God doesn't see perfectly. Uh, so the Satan and demons are already under judgment. Sentence has been fixed, and sentence is permanent. So he's already been judged. The sentence has already been decreed, and yet we haven't seen that completely accomplished yet. So um, let's go to John chapter 14. I've got so much to share with you on this. I, I don't know how much time I've got left here, but John chapter 14. And John 14, let's go to uh, verse 30. Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has no claim on on me. Friends, what Jesus states in this verse should really be our desire. That if Satan comes or a demonic force comes and they look at us, they realize that they have no claim on us. We have been bought through the precious blood of Jesus. We should not willfully enter into sin. That gives them a foothold, that gives them some kind of claim, that gives them some way to try to bring accusation against us. And I want to uh, uh, take that scripture and I want to read that scripture, John 14 and verse 30, out of the Amplified Bible. Jesus 
Jesus again says, I will not talk with you much more for the prince, the evil genius, the ruler of this world is coming and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. He has no power over me. What a powerful, powerful verse of scripture. And again, that should be our goal, that Satan has nothing in common with us. There is nothing in us that belongs to him, and he has no power over us. That can only be said as we surrender our life to Christ and make a decision to live according to the word of God. The prince of this world has already been judged declared guilty, sentenced to an eternity in, in, in the pits of hell where there is flames and weeping and wailing and all of these things, this gnashing of teeth, this place of eternal torment that was designed for Satan and the angels that followed him in rebellion. But friends, if we don't choose to live a life for God, to live according to his word, we need to be very, very careful that we have not received the grace of God in vain. So when we think about how does this apply to me that the prince of this world has been judged, he has been shown to be a murderer, a liar, a deceiver, all of these things. And now God has given you and I the freedom and the choice to live for Christ, not for ourselves, not for the world. So friends, let's remember God has declared judgment on Satan. Through the grace and the mercy of God, through the blood of Christ, we have been cleansed, we have been purified, we have been justified, and now it becomes our choice to live for God on purpose, following the will and the word of God. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to do it. That's the awesome thing. I need to close for now. Maybe we'll pick up some more on this next week. But there's so much packed into this that it's important for us to understand and grasp but let's close in prayer father thank you for your word thank you for your truth thank you for the power of the holy spirit that lives in us to be able enable us to live a life that pleases you as we choose to walk in obedience to your word which is your will now father i pray for each and every one that has joined us tonight God, bless them, strengthen them, and help them to be the men and women of God that you've called them to be. Ask you this in your precious name. Amen. Bye-bye. We'll see you in a few minutes on the Zoom meeting.